This is Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM in San Francisco. This is Arab Talk. I'm Jeshan Nam. And I'm Jamal Dejani. Jamal, we've reached a grim milestone in the genocide of Palestinians in Gaza. 34,000 Palestinians have been murdered by the Israeli military. Over 14,000 of those murdered have been Palestinian children in Gaza. Recently, a statistic was put out showing that every 10 minutes, a Palestinian child is being murdered by the Israeli military. Famine remains rampant throughout the Gaza Strip. And despite what we're hearing on the media about things easing up in Gaza, the situation on the ground remains dire. And in fact, the Israeli military is continuing its assault in Rafah and in Khan Yunus, and the situation remains dire. We're going to be covering all those stories today, uh, including some others, including because of the global condemnation of the Israeli genocide in Gaza, Jamal, the Israel brand is being permanently tarnished. There's been a global boycott, divestment, and sanctionings movement that is emerging. The brand of Israel as an economic and political power is being tarnished. We're going to review the global condemnation of the Israeli brand. Additionally, we're going to cover the recent, um, basically, military exercises and military attack by the uh, Iranian government in Israel, which is the first time Iran has sent directly a military assault to the Israeli state. We're going to be covering who won the diplomatic battle there. And of course, we should talk about the two-state solution, Jamal, rather the two-state myth. It's been getting a lot of attention to, uh, as, as it does, you know, from the Biden administration, from NATO allies. But as we've been talking about for decades, it's a myth, it's a delusion. We'll be talking about that. But before we get to those stories, Jamal, we're going to hear an interview that you did with Dr. Osama Mekdizi. He's a professor of history and chancellor's chair at the University of California, Berkeley, discussing Israel's ongoing genocide in Gaza and the context of settler colonialism and the growth of the anti-Israel movement on college campuses, including what's happening at Berkeley, Columbia, and USC. He's also going to talk about recent confrontations between Iran and Israel and the UN veto at the United States Security Council of uh, making Palestinian an independent member. It's a really great interview, Jamal. Yes, it is. And uh, let's watch and listen to Dr. Makdisi. Israel continues to slaughter Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank, disregarding a growing worldwide condemnation of its genocide in Gaza. To distract from this, Benjamin Netanyahu decided to attack Iran's consulate in Syria, killing several high-level officials. He miscalculated. Iran responded with a strategic first-ever direct attack on Israel, launching over 300 missiles and attack drones, most of which were intercepted by the United States and its so-called international coalition. Israel responded with a muted attack that caused no damage, according to Iranian officials. Have we seen an end to this confrontation, or is this a watershed moment in the conflict? At the same time, the global anti-Israel movement is growing, led by youth demanding an immediate ceasefire. In the United States, students have initiated several demonstrations and sit-ins on college campuses that are reminiscent of the anti-war outcry during the Vietnam era. The most recent is at Columbia University in New York. However, this time university administrators have been taking the lead to censor and criminalize the very students it claims to be educating to be defenders of free speech and justice. Joining us on Arab Talk this week to discuss this and more is Dr. Usama Makdisi. He is a professor of history and chancellor chair at the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome to Arab Talk, Dr. Makdisi. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Israel's ongoing genocide in Gaza might be shocking to many people, but not to historians like yourself and other academics who draw on examples of similar situations like this from the past, especially when it comes to settler colonialism. A colleague of yours, Dr. Joseph Masad from Columbia University, recently published an article 
citing several examples of brutality exacted on indigenous populations by colonial powers, but said that all precedents, uh, but said that of all precedents, Algeria is perhaps the closest example of what has been unfolding in Gaza. Uh, do you agree or disagree, and and how so? Well, first of all, I think uh, scholars should be shocked, and I'm shocked, and I think anyone with a conscience should be shocked at at the level of brutality of violence of of honestly uh um extraordinary cruelty that Israel has practiced in its genocide against the Palestinians of of Gaza in particular but also what's happening in the West Bank in East Jerusalem throughout Palestine but but most obviously in Gaza uh I think any scholar should be shocked and any scholar who who works on or thinks about the history of colonialism and the history of ethics and the history of morality should be speaking out. Alas, very few actually are. Um, as far as um, the the analogy with with other cases, each each case of genocide in history is is distinct. But the the reality is, and the tragedy is that this particular genocide is unfolding in the twenty first century. Jamal, it's happening now before our eyes. After all that we have learned allegedly about past genocides. Here we are repeating exactly the same kind of uh, lies, the same kind of fabrications, the same kind of justifications of past genocides, but we're in the 21st century. So that's what's shocking to me. What do, you, do you see any parallels between what's going on now and what the French did in uh, Algeria? Before, yes, of course. Before I mean, there are many parallels. Maybe. I mean... Yeah, and there are parallels with, uh, of course, I mean, the, the brutalization of any form of anti-colonial resistance, the, 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 extraordinary, um, the extraordinary levels of cruelty and sadism. The difference is that now we have social media, so we have an instantaneous sort of record being produced before our eyes, also of Israeli soldiers and, you know, in, in their sort of the, this honestly sick nature of, of dressing up in the in the, the the lingerie of Palestinian women who they they've displaced, brutalized, tortured, evicted, uh, traumatized, terrorized. This, I mean, I'm sure the French did similar. Maybe I mean, from what I understand, the French did similar things. The difference is that 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 this is all being live streamed now before our eyes, and we have access to all this right away. There's never been a history of or a, an episode of genocide. Uh, a structure of genocide being un unfolding before our eyes where where we have all this information before us. So I think that's what makes this this particular episode extraordinarily uh, uh, depraved in that sense. It's not to say that the French didn't do similar things. They did, but not in the 21st century. I mean, it was a while ago. It was decades ago. So this is, and that was the end of something, the end of a long history of colonialism. Here we are in the 21st century having allegedly learned the lessons of the past, repeating yet again the same kinds of justifications for dehumanization of an entire people. So I think, yeah, there are parallels with Algeria, for sure. There are parallels with what happened to Native Americans in this country. There are parallels to what happened to um, um, black slave uprisings and their repression and their representation. There are parallels to what happened to South Africans. There are parallels to what happened to Australia, to Aborigines, to, to Native peoples throughout the world. So I think there are many different parallels, for sure. You talk about people are, are seeing this in real time on social media and, and other uh, satellite TV and so on. And there is a popular uprising globally, and we've seen millions of people demonstrating from New York to London and so forth. But governments are not budging. I mean, even though government officials, and I'm talking about the United States, England, and others, who are seeing their own populations demonstrating and calling for a ceasefire, and yet they are not budging. Why, I mean, how do you explain this? The same way these same governments didn't budge when, when there was massive protest against the, the run-up to the Iraq invasion of 2003 under extraordinarily false pretenses, as everyone knew at the time, Anyone who knew anything about the history or read carefully or thought carefully saw that the Bush administration had invented um, a campaign of disinformation, and yet there were huge demonstrations throughout the world, also in the U.S., which were ignored by the administration. So now you have also, as you said, Jamal, you have massive demonstrations 
continuous demonstration for months and months and months. And of course, these governments, which are not beholden to their people, they're beholden to interests, they're beholden to lobbies, they're beholden to special interests, they're beholden to their own warped ideology, they're beholden to the status quo, they're not beholden to their people. The question is, will they be held account when time comes during the election season? Let's see. But I'm not surprised that, that these administrations and these governments and these regimes throughout the West don't respond to popular pressure because, frankly, they don't care. That's my sense, at least. Let's talk about the, what's going on on college campuses. Campus protests are vigorous and ongoing since Israel attacked Gaza. The protests at Columbia University have overtaken the news this week. Uh, the university has suspended few students, and several students have been arrested uh, by NYPD. Uh, these persistent campus demonstrations for a ceasefire are reminiscent of those during the Vietnam War. Some say that it's the academic administrators who have taken over the role of enforcer as opposed to government officials in the 1960s. Do you agree with this uh, assessment? Uh, to an extent, of course, remember, in the 1960s, government, I mean, campus administrations also, in, in many instances, including, as far as I understand, here at UC Berkeley, took the side initially of the government and were involved in repressing student activism. So there's nothing surprising about the fact that administrations throughout this country are siding with the status quo and repressing student activism. The difference, again, is that we're in the 21st century and that these are, as you said, these are the largest demonstrations, um, the largest arrests, I should say, sorry, of, of Colombia, for example, the largest mass arrests of students since the Vietnam War, which tells you, again, that we're at, a, we're at an inflection point here. Something is changing. Students understand, in part because they have access to the social media, in part because they take at one level seriously, correctly, because they're ethical, the fact that, that there should be some accountability that that knowledge is not just produced for the sake of knowledge but also for the sake of making a better world students are aware of that at least many students are aware of that especially the coalition the extraordinarily beautiful and diverse coalition of students of all faiths who are fighting for justice um in palestine and, uh, and about palestine so that's what we see on campuses and we see university administrators that by and large want to ghost the palestinian the Palestinian protests and the pro-Palestinian solidarity because they understand that these students are A, pointing out their own hypocrisy, and B, they are shaming them and embarrassing these administrations that claim to be about diversity and equity and inclusion and justice, but in reality really are about the status quo. And so that's what's happening right now. To take this further, in a, a McCarthy-esque uh, congressional hearing, I would say, with Columbia University President Shafiq, uh, the line of questioning focused almost exclusively on framing legitimate criticism of Israel and its human rights abuses as anti-Semitic and threatening. Instead of standing up and defending students' rights to critique and question uh, systematic injustice, Shafiq was eager uh, to agree and appease her in interlocutors. Uh, are we seeing the core values of academic freedom being abandoned by administrators for the sake of donors and their political agendas? Uh, it depends on which universities, but uh, I mean, certainly what, what, what the president of Columbia did in her testimony was to throw faculty and students under the bus without any question, and in large part, presumably to appease the donors her donors and also to appease the the, the inquisitors who were who were sort of uh, involved in this extraordinary uh, you know masquerade of, of uh, or show a show trial of sorts like an inquisition basically conflating you know profound legitimate important necessary uh, calls for justice and Palestine and solidarity with the Palestinians who are being subjected to an actual genocide with anti with anti-Semitism and this conflation I think tells us so much about how the the side that supports the state of Israel in America no longer presents an intellectual or historical argument for their cause. They simply smear their opponents, i.e. the vast coalition of students of all faiths, including, by the way, anti-Zionist Jewish 
ethical students and faculty and staff with the with the smear of anti-Semitism because they have nothing left to argue for. They don't argue for something. They argue simply that everybody who opposes them is an anti-Semite, which tells you just how 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 much they've retreated and how much they've lost the historical, intellectual, ethical argument here. And so they resort to sheer intimidation. And that's what you see unfolding. I mean, the, the show trials or these, these inquisitions that you see are, are a scandal, frankly. And anyone who's following them should be shocked at the idea of, you know, House representatives quoting the, the, the book of Genesis. And honestly, I mean, have you ever seen this happening? And seeing university administrators, rather than saying, you know what, Universities are places where we have academic freedom, where we have debates, where we have intellectual discussions, where we have many different points of view, and that's what universities should be. And the last I heard in the United States, especially at institutions of higher education, we should be encouraging debates and discussion and, and different viewpoints. Instead, you have this extraordinary, as you said, I wish you could call it just McCarthyist, because it's, it's McCarthyism without McCarthy, but it's also McCarthyism occurring in the context of an actual obliteration of Palestine, Palestinian society in Gaza, the obliteration of every university in Gaza, the obliteration of teachers, the obliteration of students, the obliteration of schools. This is what's actually happening on the ground. And yet all this show trial, these inquisitions are there to distract and to reframe the debate, not about justice for actual people who are suffering an actual genocide, but in fact to invent the so-called scourge of anti-Semitism on campuses, precisely because they conflate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. It really pains me, actually, this whole thing about Columbia University, because I went to Columbia University, and my one of my early uh, first courses in political science was about civil disobedience and reading Thoreau and Emerson, and then to see this happening. Uh, another student censored uh, was the brilliant uh, valedictorian at University of Southern California, Asna Tawasram, whose speech was allegedly cancelled by the provost Andrew Guzman because of Asna's uh, pro-Palestinian social uh, media post. And safety, this is another example, they used safety concerns this time uh, was uh, were, uh, were cited as the reason. In the past, USC has hosted right-wing extremists Ben Shapiro and Milo, and Milo Yiannopoulos, unlike Asna Tabasam, they are provocative speakers renowned for unapologetic, hateful rhetoric. Yet USC was prepared to address safety concerns by providing additional security in the interest of giving an equal platform to divergent views. Is this the Palestine exception? Racism, yes, of course. Absolutely, or all three. Uh, of course, absolutely. It's of course it's the Palestine exception. Of course, it is for the first time actually in the case of USC, as far as I'm aware, it's the first time they ever cancel a valedictorian's speech. And not only that, they've rearranged the entire sort of commencement, as far as I can tell, at USC. That's the last I heard. Uh, in other words, they keep on trying to avoid the question of Palestine, because they're embarrassed by the fact that on this issue, administrations which all condemned the Palestinian violence of October 7th have said not a word, as far as I can tell, about the vastly greater violence that's been committed for over seven months on Palestinians, on Palestinian educators, on Palestinian children, on Palestinian men, women, on Palestinian civilians before our eyes for months and months. They've said nothing. And so they need to censor and censor and censor, always, of course, in the name either of security or of anti-Semitism or of something. They never want to actually talk about the issue at hand. Of course, it's the Palestine exception. And it's also, the, the, the frankly, the cowardice of um, and the hypocrisy of administrators who can't actually come out and say, well, the reason we're actually censoring this brilliant valedictorian is because we can't bear to listen to what she has to say about Palestine, or because we need to appease our donors, or because we are terrified of the U.S. government's you know, witch hunt, or whatever it is. They never tell you the truth. They just always invent some kind of technicality. Um, even if it's the first time in the history of USC that they do this, they do this. Of course, it's the exception, 100%. Nevertheless, uh, th there is uh, so much commitment and fortitude among the students and young people here and globally 
throughout these last six months. Many of them stand firm in their convictions in the face of being blacklisted or having job offers rescinded. Do you see ways that this conviction is transforming into more stable, enduring structures of change? And that depends on what happens to this generation as it grows up and as it mature, you know, as it, you know, as it as it, it um, gets into the workforce and so on and so forth. But you're absolutely right. There is a huge change taking place, a sea change taking place at the level of students, at the level of youth, at the level a generational change, because most people with a conscience of any faith who are, are following what is happening in Palestine are horrified, not just by the reality of the the cruelty and the depravity of the genocide occurring in the 21st century, but by the spectacular nature of it that's being recorded before everyone's eyes. The Israelis don't hide what they're doing, starving an entire population of children in the year 2024. I mean, it's it's beyond belief, actually. Honestly, when you sit and think about it, there's no justification for this. And anyone who pretends that there's a justification is has lost the youth because the, most youth simply don't accept this. So I think there's there's a huge change taking place. What its effects will be, we have to wait and see. I want to talk about the the two other big stories. Uh, one, of course, the let's talk about uh, start by talking about the recent confrontation between Israel and Iran. Was Israel's intent to sideline attention from Gaza? Uh, both parties, of course, are claiming victory in this brief encounter. Are there winners and losers? And is this a glimpse of what might happen between the two countries in the future? Or just this was just like a quick thing that happened because Benjamin Netanyahu wanted to divert attention from the ongoing genocide in Gaza? Yeah, that's, uh, well, I think Netanyahu has clearly been pushing for a while, and the Israeli government has been pushing for a while for the U.S. to be involved in, and this is my reading of it, uh, you know, that for the U.S. to do its its dirty work with Iran, in other words, to fight a war, to get the U.S. to be involved in a war with Iran. It already convinced the Trump administration to pull out unilaterally of a, a negotiated deal. We all know this. And that was under, almost entirely under US, Israeli pressure, I should say, Israeli pressure and lobbying and so on and so forth. So whether this was done, the, this, the bombing of a consulate or embassy, whatever it was, I think it's in, it was on the embassy premises of, the, uh, of the, uh, the Iranian embassy in Damascus, the Israeli bombing was shocking. It was obviously a violation of international law. It was clearly meant to provoke the Iranians and also, but I don't know if it's just to distract from the war in Gaza. I don't, because the Israelis are not distracting. They're just keep, they keep doing what they're doing in Gaza. It was part of that war, I think. It's the idea of trying to crush trying ultimately to crush any form of resistance to Israeli hegemony in the region. And that's, uh, that's, that's, what I, that's what I see. I see that's how I read this particular incident. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the tit for tat or the, the clearly something has, has changed, the fact that Iran struck Israel from Iranian soil for the first time ever uh, tells you that something is changing. Again, what and how, that all depends on how things play out you know, in the near future, before one can say with any certainty what what the effects will be, but I, I don't think it's just about distracting. I think it's about a, these are all connected to each other. The war on Palestine has has both a regional dimension and, of course, most obviously, um, a local sort of genocidal dimension in Gaza. So we cannot end this conversation without talking about the uh, the vote at the UNSC. Uh, the United States and its worn-out mantra of the two-state solution showed its naked hypocrisy once again when it vetoed the draft resolution at the UNSC that would recommend to the 193-member UN General Assembly that the state of Palestine be admitted to membership of the UN. Twelve of the 15 members voted yes. Britain and Switzerland abstained, and the United States casted the sole no your reaction to this, what would recognition of Palestinian statehood by the United Nations mean in practical terms? And, and this whole thing, Biden and, and every other U.S. official keep talking about the two-state solutions. And then when, when, when you have meaningful actions, they just say no. So what's going on? 
So I don't think it's hypocrisy as such. I think it's totally consistent with the U.S. line. The two-state solution discourse is there to distract. They're not serious about a two-state solution. So their veto makes sense because they're absolutely not serious about the two-state solution. They use that as a way of delaying, of distracting, of of constantly sort of prevaricating because that's what U.S. policy on Palestine has been for decades. To avoid dealing with the Palestinian question in any serious or substantial way, other than demanding of the Palestinians more concessions, more surrender, more submission. That's the U.S. peace process in a nutshell, as far as the Palestinians are concerned. So the veto is in line with the logic of U.S. policy, which is deeply anti-Palestinian. So I think that that's, I mean, so, and then in terms of anyone who is still, is still in the fantasy world of a two-state solution, they need to ask themselves, what does a two-state solution actually mean? What kind of two states are we talking about? And and really push them on this issue because most people who talk about a two-state solution are doing this to avoid dealing with the racism, the apartheid, the genocidal nature, um, the supremacist nature, really, of, of what is happening now in the state of Israel in terms of its domination of Palestinians um, as non-Jews in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, in Gaza, in terms of the right of return versus the law of return and so on and so forth. There's a million things that we can go into. But the whole point of the two-state solution is to avoid talking about the current reality, which is that there's one state, Israel, which dominates and devastates Palestinian life and community and history and society in Gaza, in East Jerusalem, in the West Bank. And of course, that refuses to allow refugees, Palestinian refugees who were expelled in the time of the Nakba of 1948, from exercising their their legal right and their right under international law of returning to their homes and properties. So I think that's what this is all about, frankly. What about Arab regimes that are playing along, signing like, for example, the Abraham The same, Accords, I mean, the, the Arab regimes... Uh, and sitting on the yeah. sideline watching a, you know, 33,000 plus Palestinians getting slaughtered in Gaza. Well, I mean, the Arab regime, you know exactly, you know the the answer to that. The Arab regimes, the entire Arab state system, as we know it today, was set up by the British after World War One and the French, but mostly the British after World War One, in, in the Mashriq, at least, in the Arab East. And it was referred to by the British themselves as an Arab facade. In other words, a facade of imperial and colonial rule behind, uh, that you'd have a local ruler, an Arab ruler, behind which there would be the imperial power that actually runs the show. And so the very notion of Arab state sovereignty was briefly challenged by the rise of revolutionary countries and you know governments in the 1950s, most obviously Abdel Nasser in Egypt. But since the defeat of Abdel Nasser in 67, there has been in Egypt in 67, there has been, you know, the Arab states have reverted to being essentially, um, um, they have their own regional, they have their own, I should say, immediate dynastic you know, regime interests that they're very, very determined to sort of um, protect, and but they're not going to challenge the regional order anymore in any way, shape, or form. Honestly, they're not going to do that. And they're that, as we see in in their their total the complicity in in the destruction of the Palestinians and the fact that Arab states that have ties with Israel, not one, as far as I can tell, not a single Arab country with relations with Israel has actually suspended or cut its ties with Israel in a moment of genocide. Whereas countries like South Africa, countries in Central and South America have actually taken the lead in in sort of pushing the case of, of genocide to the ICJ. The Arab states have done, as far as I can tell, absolutely nothing, uh, except, except go along with and act as mediators for Israeli and American demands. That That's what I see the Arab states right now that's their role they have their own immediate as i said dynastic interests because they're most of them all of them in fact are are absolute estates or dictatorships um but they don't have the interests either of their own people or of the palestinians in mind dr osama makdisi thank you for coming on arab talk thank you for having me that's the voice and the face of Dr. Usama Mekdizi, Professor of History and Chancellor's Chair at UC Berkeley, discussing a wide range of topics regarding the uh, Israeli genocide and its political implications 
uh, in the United States and globally. I think it was a very compelling uh, interview, Jamal. And one of the things that I really uh, thought was uh, really important about uh, Dr. Mekdazi's, uh analysis is that we get a lot of pushback about whether or not Israel is genuinely a settler colonial state. We see pushback from pro-Israel forces. But in fact, uh, Professor Mekdazi contextualizes historically how Israel truly uh, is a settler colonial project. And what it's doing right now is an extension of that settler colonial project. The apartheid state of Israel and its genocidal activity that it's uh, uh, perpetrating right now against Palestinian civilians is creating the largest most significant negative backlash against the Israeli state in its history. I mean, we heard in our previous interview with uh, Professor Mekdazi that the Israeli state is a product of a settler colonial project with its logical outcome to be the genocide and the uprooting of its indigenous Palestinian inhabitants. And now what we're seeing as a result of the genocide is this global movement. And the one thing that, that has really been impressive to me, and I know to you, Jamal, is and the word we use is intersectionality and you alluded to this intersectionality meaning that this is not just groups of pro palestine activists we're seeing climate activists we're seeing social justice activists we're seeing activists from the api the black lives matter uh the latinx communities we're seeing LGBTQ plus folks, and more importantly, labor activists, I should have mentioned as well. Yes, labor activists, but, and this is really needs to be discussed, a very large Jewish basis uh, of support for Palestine, Palestinian liberation, and condemnation of the genocide. So you have Jewish Voice for Peace, and this is really important, and it just was discussed Interestingly, in the in the mainstream media, especially in the New York Times, all these hand wringings about how Jewish students at Columbia do not feel safe, whether it's Columbia or Berkeley or whatever. But even the New York Times had to put in their articles, Jamal, they said this. However, there are a large number of Jewish students on campus who do feel safe. They may condemn anti-Semitism. But they stand shoulder to shoulder with Palestine activists condemning the Israeli brutality and genocide. So when you have Jewish students, and I might add a significant number of Jewish students and just large numbers of the Jewish community standing in solidarity against Israel, this changes the whole narrative. And, you know, the Israel brand of this, you know, magnificent kind of economic, uh, intellectual power is being more than just tarnished, Jamal, but being um, discounted, and it's reviving this decade's call from Palestinian civil society for the boycott, divestment, and sanctioning of Israel. And what we're seeing on campuses is a revival of these demands. And if you look at the Columbia students, Jamal, what are their demands? The demands are divest, boycott, and sanction Israel. We should Colombia should not have investments that support this apartheid genocidal state. And we're seeing this across campuses, not just in the United States, but globally. So I think the brand is permanently tarnished. I don't think Israel will ever recover from this brand uh, tarnishment. To add, on, to add to this, Jess, I have never seen CNN featuring some of the stories like they are doing yeah. now about you've mentioned the trans you know the different communities who have joined in uh you know uh, we've mentioned labor we've mentioned for example i didn't mention also black clergy who joined uh, this right. movement but recently they've had at least two stories that, that i've watched talking to young people uh one of the stories that stuck in my mind was uh interviewing young african-american uh Oh yeah, uh, folks, right there in Atlanta, Georgia, and 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 basically the interview was about why they won't be voting for Biden, and the first answer was because he supports a genocide in Gaza, and that right. we will never vote for him. And then when the uh, interviewer pushed uh, back on them and said, "Well, if you vote for him, 
you're going to bring Trump. I don't think you want Trump to be back as president. And this is Atlanta, Georgia, where Biden won by, I think, less than 10,000 votes. And they said, right. we don't care. This is his problem, not our problem. This is on him. And then the last question was, well, what it would take for you to change your mind? And he said, they said, we want an immediate ceasefire and we want to stop any aid to Israel. That the, and, and you could see the look at the face of the reporter, but, but they won't budge. This, these are, I would say, young group of African Americans between the age of uh, 20 to 30 that, uh, you know, to me, there's, they have no connection to Palestine, but they have a connection to humanity and they have a connection injustice. to their experience and injustice. Yeah. And they're seeing it in real time. And this is something no amount of Hasbara money that APAC and the ADL and other organizations can, can spend to make them change their mind. No, Jamal, you're exactly right. And listen, the brand, not only is it tarnished, but, but here's something even more critical. The brand is deeply problematic. And if you look at the majority, the recent polling, the majority of Americans, this is all Americans, Jamal, the majority of Americans disagree with Biden's uh, prosecution and support of Israel. And the majority of Americans are, are demanding a ceasefire from, from Israel. If you break it down among Democrats, and this is why the Democrats have a huge problem, and they have a big convention coming up in Chicago this summer, 70% of Democrats, 70% of Democrats are questioning their support for Israel and demanding a ceasefire. So I think what we have, Jamal, is a is a major shift in the political analysis, something that you and I have been talking about for decades now. And the idea is support for Israel is not in the strategic interests of the United States. We've been saying it, the data support that, uh, what Biden is doing, sending 2,000 pound bombs to Israel while a Palestinian child is being murdered every 10 minutes is not an American value. Americans don't buy it. And they're seeing the deeply moral and ethical problem of supporting a state, a so-called state like Israel, when they're committing these war crimes and these crimes against humanity. So I think we're seeing something, Jamal, that the, the, the uh, state of Israel and all of its manifestations uh, is never going to recover from. This is not something that will ever change. I mean, we're seeing a generational shift in people's understanding of what it means to have this ethnocracy in this brutal apartheid state and what it's doing to Palestinians. It's pretty dramatic, actually. It's very dramatic. And, and we're seeing also now that the Israeli uh, propaganda or Hasbara machine uh, has run out of any... What else can... <laughs> any what, what can new they say? inventions or stories or lies and they are quickly resorting to the labels of anti-Semitism. What's going on at Columbia University and college campuses? Oh, it's anti-Semitism. You criticize Israel, what is that? It's anti-Semitism. You vote uh, to, to admit uh, Palestine to the United Nations, that's also anti-Semitism. Just listen to their words. There is nothing else that they are saying except except using the anti-Semitism charge, and people are not buying it. They are not people buying buy it. it. It's not, it does not have the same scary effect that it used to have because it's just like crying wolf so many times, you know, when they constantly basically uh, accuse people of anti-Semitism for anything and, and conflating criticism of Israel and, and Zionism with, with, with anti-Semitism is not working anymore for them. And that's, that's like, this is when I look at everything and I see and I say, well, that's it. They're running out of ammunition. That's basically what they, they've been going through. Well, I, 
I think your I think your analysis is right, and the, there are multiple problems with that being the last uh, talking point that Israeli uh, and pro-Israel Hasbara had. It, the problem is that when you cry woof so much, legitimate forms of anti-Semitism uh, fall by the wayside. Then you know, and that's a problem too. And the reality of of the situation in the United States and globally right now is that people are criticizing the military apartheid actions of the state of Israel, Jamal. They're not criticizing Israel because of uh, because of the Jewish community in, in Israel. They're criticizing Israel because of its military genocidal activities, the way Israel is starving Palestinians deliberately, the way Israel is killing civilians, the way Israel is creating hardship on the ground for Palestinians, not just in Gaza, but in the West Bank, and and the world sees it, Jamal. So this crying woof, this kind of claim that, uh, you know, the Jewish students on campus don't feel safe, people are not buying it. And we have to give credit where credit is due. I mean, the brave members of the Jewish community who are standing up at Columbia, at Yale, at Berkeley, at Pritzker, uh, all over the United States, all the campuses, you have the brave uh, community members in the Jewish community who are saying, we feel safe. This is not the issue. We're criticizing the state of Israel that is not anti-Semitic. So I think this analysis we're seeing, and I don't know how you feel about it, but to me, especially with what's happening in Colombia, it seems like there's a tipping point, Jamal. It seems like there's a tipping point where groundswell of activity is is happening right now in terms of this this new analysis uh, of the apartheid state. People aren't buying the Hasbara anymore. And my question to you is, well, if the anti-Semitism claim doesn't work anymore, what are they going to do next, Jamal? What's going to be next in terms of the Hasbara? I don't know. Uh, well, what's happening, actually, the, the next thing, and sadly, these are the people who are on the payroll of APAC, or they basically succumb to APAC from politicians. They are trying to take actions, legal actions. I mean, you have congressmen, congresswomen making statements, calling these uh, students are pro-Hamas, and they are, uh, or they are uh, labeling them directly, that these are Hamas demonstrating, you know, they are terrorists, and so forth. And this is coming from the mouths of government officials who know better. And then you have, on the other hand, uh, university administrators who are calling the police on, on their own students. Uh, just, I mean, at Columbia University, uh, when I studied uh, political science there, one of, my, one of my first courses was about civil disobedience. And I had to read Thoreau and Emerson. And now... Right. They are basically calling the police on students who are practicing their right for civil disobedience. And, 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 and it's kind of ironic in a way. I mean, it, and, and that's what's going on. And that's the other way is we talk about political, well, the political pressure that, that's ongoing. Um, you could go to now a new website and find out uh, about how 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 much how much money each and everyone uh, from congressmen and congresswomen and senators receive from APAC? But at the same time, you should also look at the donor money that comes to universities, and the universities right. are more worried about donor money than they are worried about their own students, and that's what's going on. Yeah, and I think you're making a, a, an important point, which we need to uh, amplify here. You know, look at what happened at Columbia two days ago, Jamal. As you said, a hundred over a hundred students were arrested. Some were dismissed. Some were expelled. Some lost their housing. Um, and this is at the hands of the new Columbia president, right, Manushe uh, Shafiq, uh, and she's in deep trouble because guess what happened the very next day after these hundred over 100 student protesters were arrested by the New York Police Department. Hundreds more students came back to the square in Columbia, Jamal, and they're protesting with increased fervor. You have faculty. You have Yale now doing the same thing. You're seeing campuses across the country, um, 
you know, mimicking and supporting what's happening in Colombia. So I think uh, President Shafiq has made a grave error. She's privileging uh, donors over her students. Uh, they decided, uh, she sent out an email this morning, I, I don't know if you saw it, Jamal, basically saying the campus feels so unsafe that classes are going to be moved to uh, online. I mean, she's digging herself into a deep, deep And there order. was a statement by Jewish students who support the demonstrators and who demonstrate with them. Right. Uh, who actually celebrated their holiday with the Passover with yeah. the Passover with the students right there on campus. So right. so that's not what you're hearing in the media when you talk about making campus unsafe. It's making no, I'll tell you what make it's making people uncomfortable. Some people are, are 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 made uncomfortable that for the very first time you have these students basically saying enough is enough with your support of, of this support of a genocide, enough is enough with invest, investing the student resources in Israel, but it is not an unsafe campus. Well, I'll tell you what makes campus unsafe, Jamal, calling the police and having the police tear gas students, arrest students, and making students homeless. The police and President Shafiq are making the campus life unsafe. It Palestine and Palestinian protesters protesting against genocide. In terms of their fundamental uh, constitutional right to do so, is not making the campus unsafe. The president of Colombia is making students unsafe. And I think we need to call that out as much as possible. You know, Jamal, and you said this, and it needs to be echoed and repeated multiple times, feeling uncomfortable is not the same as feeling unsafe. And if you feel uncomfortable hearing that Israel is an apartheid state or that it's committing genocide, you know, maybe you should feel uncomfortable. It's a very uncomfortable truth about what's happening in Palestine right now. But your discomfort does not mean you are unsafe. And that needs to be said over and over and over again. Moving on to the next big story for this week that kind of like came so quickly and now disappeared, which was <laughs> Iran's uh, retaliation uh, on, on, on Israel. And, and just to give it some right. background, Israel bombed the Iranian consulate in, in Syria, killing several high officials. And this is not the first time that Israel has assassinated Iranian officials or bombed targets in Syria and other places. But this was a red line for Iran. And Benjamin Netanyahu miscalculated. He miscalculated the response, and the response came very quickly. Uh, however, uh, there's a lot of things in it, because people are trying to guess this and trying, oh, look, they downed all the missiles and 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 try to find ang angles to say that Israel was the winner in this case, which I don't think so. It was, it, Israel was a big loser. And as I said, Benjamin Netanyahu miscalculated. And few points, because I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this, is that had Iran's intent been to really hurt Israel, it wouldn't have violated a core principle of military operations, which is the element of surprise, right? <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. But it did. It telegraphed its intentions to Washington and several Arab and European capitals and assured them that its strike uh, would be relatively limited, but it's coming. And that's why President Biden, days before he was saying, yeah, we're getting ready, moving some military probably uh, uh, ships into closer to the Mediterranean, getting everyone ready to to intercept, uh, you know, that strike. So, of course, and the second thing that uh, instead of employing uh, its, uh, you know, uh, major, I would say, hypersonic uh, rockets, Israel used... Uh, and precision-guided, I would say, ballistic missiles, Israel basically used most of its strike uh, consisted of 
slow-moving drones. Yeah, that, that, that took, took seven took, hours. Yeah, it took, it took yeah, seven yeah, hours maybe to four, get... but I don't know. You know, I mean, to kind of intercept and used right. only very few of the hyper, hypersonic, which struck Dimona and an Israeli air base. And Israel managed to get a lot of highly useful information gathering. It was a highly useful information gathering exercise for, uh, I mean, sorry, for Iran. Basically now, right. they they know where these planes that came to intercept, where which base did they leave from? Like the, I'm talking about the American planes, right? Did right. they come out of right. Cyprus or somewhere else? Right. How long it took them? How look uh, is, how to, how long it took Israel to respond? And of course, a lot of information that they've gathered from from the air, and it was a major shock. I would say a major shock and a ma major miscalculation to Netanyahu because he managed to get away with murder all this time, and uh, which I don't know if many people know, but almost every single month Israel strikes something outside of its border, whether it be it in Syria Jamal, or Lebanon, and, and there, there is no response to that. Jamal, how many times has the Israeli military violated international law and sent missiles to Syria and Lebanon and killed the civilians? And they did it with, they've done it with impunity. I think this is a much bigger deal than we're hearing about in the media because, you know, this is the first time that Iran has launched a missile attack directly against uh, Israel. This is a big deal, Jamal, and I think you're exactly right. You know, they telegraphed it, they reassured everybody, but here's the other part of the story that we're not hearing about. You know, the Israeli Hasbara machine said, oh, we were able to intercept 99% of the missiles, blah, blah, blah. It's a joke because what they're not telling you, Jamal, is a large number of missiles were downed by US and Jordanian forces, you know, who were uh, given warning about when and where these missiles were coming from. And you're exactly right. If this were truly a surprise and the Iranians wanted to not prep everybody and send, you know, the full strength of their, their military uh, prowess against, the, uh, against Israel, it would have been much more devastating because this red line has been crossed, Jamal. Somehow, the Iranians' idea or the idea or the perception that Iran would never strike Israel directly, would only do it by their proxies, that, that red line is gone. And I think you're exactly right. Netanyahu miscalculated. As a result of that miscalculation, unfortunately, what he's doing now is um, increasing the bloodshed and the attacks on innocent Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, Jamal, which we don't hear anything about in the mainstream media. The West Bank, which today is a global you know, strike in the West Bank uh, because of the atrocities that the Israeli military and their settlers are committing against Palestinians have been occurring with impunity too. So, you know, you're exactly right. This was a grave miscalculation on the part of Netanyahu. Well, and one last thing, $1.7 billion, that's the bill that cost the United States to protect Israel. And just did that. Uh, just, just for that. that. And and then we, when we talk about this, you know, the United States like to present everything like in the form of a coalition, like when the United States invaded Iraq, put a coalition, but you know who did the heavy lifting was the United States. And in this case, they said we had a coalition, coalition made up of the United States, the UK and France and like Jordan participated, Jordan. but uh, most of the work was done by the United States. And the bill is anywhere between $1.2 billion and $1.7 billion that's going to cost the American taxpayer for, for, to protect, basically, Israel. I mean, it, wasn't, it didn't come cheap. And they just, but they just released another $26 billion from Congress this weekend, Jamal. That will that's be another, an, another long discussion about this. Uh, <laughs> we don't have the time to go into details, but I want to move on to the next story very quickly, Jess, is the vote at the United Nations. We have President Biden. We have the uh, Secretary of State Blinken. 
Every time that they talk about Palestine, is that they say we support the two-state solution. This is just like like they parrot that that statement every, time and time again. We support a two-state solution. And what did they do when the the at the United Nations there is a vote to admit Palestine to the United? I mean, if you support another state, they're the only country that says no. Uh, they uh, they veto it. And there was. Um, uh, I guess the UK and Switzerland and that that's abstained, but we go ag- again through another ve- another veto, and and I don't know in good conscience how these officials keep repeating the two state solution when they know it's non-existent. Well, Jamal, it's part of the delusion. It's part of the delusion that Biden, Blinken and the United Nations representative, Ambassador Greenfield. It's part of this grand American-Israeli delusion. You keep saying two-state, two-state, two-state. You know, those are the words. But if you look at the actions, what are the actions of the United States? If you look at the actions rather than the words, they don't support a two-state solution. They do not support a Palestinian state. They do not believe in equal rights for Palestinians or sovereignty or self-determination. I mean, every single vote, Jamal, has been to crush the possibility of Palestinian aspirations for freedom, for dignity, for self-determination. So why is the United States, why is Biden, why is Blinken, why are they so surprised that uh, their policies are causing such a headache for them globally, as well as for their electoral politics? And I have to go back to something you said earlier in the show today, uh, quoting those young African-American um, you know, activists who said, if Trump gets elected because of Biden policies, it's on it's on Biden. It's not on any of us. And this is what they're doing. Their words mean nothing. They say that they want Palestinian civilians protected, but at the same time, every 10 minutes a Palestinian child is killed. Famine is rampant. The West Bank is on fire. Does that really sound like the United States supports Palestinian uh, aspirations for freedom, dignity, and self-determination? I don't think so, Jamal. You've been listening to Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco 89.5 FM. Go to our website, arabtalkradio.com, to download the latest shows, and we'll talk to you next week. We'll see you next week. We'll see you next week.